How much do you miss dinosaurs? Would your life be richer if a giant prehistoric flying lizard occasionally settled on your front lawn? I'll be right back. Since the beginning of life on this planet, thousands of species, plant and animal, have disappeared every century as part of the evolutionary process in an ever-changing world. We as humans share a feeling of guilt because as our numbers have increased, we've contributed to the disappearance of some species by destroying their habitat or hunting them down for food, fur, and feathers. And sometimes our guilt makes us forget those thousands of species that simply ceased to exist before man ever appeared in the primeval swamp. Today, we're trying to halt as best we can our contribution to or hastening of the disappearance of existing plant and animal life. We've identified endangered species and passed laws preventing any act by man which might reduce their numbers. And I'm sure there's general agreement with this policy. But shouldn't we now and then remember nature's part in the elimination of some species and separate the serious from the silly in our own policy? Up in Maine, a mammoth hydroelectric generating facility was scheduled to be constructed in a part of America, the Northeast, where power is in short supply. The Dickey Lincoln Dam site was key to this $1.3 billion project on the St. John River. Many factors were taken into consideration, and a great deal of study went into planning such an expensive project, as you can well imagine. Then, about a year ago, someone discovered a clump of wildflowers, about 200 in all, in the area to be flooded by the building of the dam. They were a species of snapdragon thought to be extinct, called the Furbish lousewort. The $1.3 billion Dickey Lincoln Generating Facility is now halted, stopped dead in its tracks by the Endangered Species Act of 1973. I'm not a botanist, but isn't it possible those plants could be transplanted? I've transplanted wildflowers on the ranch with little or no trouble at all. I've even gathered seeds and helped the spread of some types to other parts of the ranch. And can anyone really say there aren't other clumps of furbish lousewort hidden in the woods of Maine as this clump was hidden? until humans invaded the area to build a dam? Down on the Little Tennessee River, the Tennessee Valley Authority has been building a dam to produce electricity for about 200,000 homes, and I don't know how many industries providing jobs for people in those homes. This project has been going on for about 10 years so far. $116 million have been spent, and the huge Teleco Dam is 95% complete. Apparently, that's as far as it'll get. A federal court has stopped construction because a three-inch fish called the snail darter, has been found to spawn in the waters of the Little Tennessee River. This particular snail darter is an endangered species, even though it differs only slightly from the 77 other kinds of darters found in the rivers of Tennessee. To date, more than 200 projects have been halted to protect, among other things, an inedible clam, some crayfish, and freshwater snails. And the Fish and Wildlife Service announces it is now going to classify as endangered some 1,700 species of plants. It is time to ask if some environmentalists, and I do mean some, aren't using the Endangered Species Act of 1973 simply to halt construction of projects they don't like. Which is too bad, because most of the billions of dollars I've mentioned would be in paychecks. This is Ronald Reagan. Thanks for listening. I've been waiting for information on one facet of the big blackout story in New York and finally have it. I'll be right back. Utility companies, more than some other industries, are vulnerable to charges of villainy. And so it was no surprise that Consolidated Edison in New York would be pilloried for the recent blackout in Fun City. To hear some tell it, you'd think the company planned the whole thing. The attacks were made more bitter than usual by the looting that broke out in several neighborhoods. Of course, those with no charity whatsoever for Con Ed, as it is dubbed, played the sorrowing parent where the looters were concerned. Our ambassador to the United Nations even seemed to have the attitude that stealing is something everyone does when the lights go out. The Brooklyn district attorney has released some figures which contradict those bleeding hearts who saw the looters as just hungry people who had a chance to eat for a change. It seemed 48% were regularly employed, many by the city itself. 41% were in anti-poverty or educational programs funded by government, and fewer than 10% were on welfare. The hunger excuse doesn't hold up either when you see a breakdown of the looter's targets. There was that automobile dealer who lost more than 50 cars, 39 furniture stores, 20 drug stores, 17 jewelry stores, 10 clothing stores, and only six grocery stores. The looters had an appetite, but not for food. But to get back to Con Ed, 
I kept wondering when, if ever, someone would look back down the last few years to see whether consumer-minded politicians might have put thumbs down on requests by the company to expand or upgrade its facilities. After all, a utility isn't exactly a free agent. Yes, it is a privately owned, profit-making business, but it is also a government-regulated monopoly controlled by politically appointed commissioners. Victor Rizel, the noted columnist and expert on labor affairs, did look back over the years and found that a yes several years ago instead of a no could have made the blackout impossible. Con Ed made application to build a hydroelectric generating plant on the banks of the Hudson near West Point. The company explained the need and the possibility of power shortages unless the plant was built. But environmentalists would have none of it. First, it would mar the scenery. Con Ed replied to that with plans to put it completely underground. Opponents said the concrete tube bringing the water from the river to the turbines would still be visible. Then fishermen got into the act and said the warm water returning to the river would interfere with and reduce the striped bass in the Hudson. Con Ed volunteered to build and maintain a fish hatchery to keep the river stocked. This too was turned down, which adds to the suspicion that we have an element in this country that just doesn't want any additional power plants, period. And all their environmental complaints are excuses to hide their real purpose. Had that generating plant been built, there would probably have been no blackout, no looting, no small merchants wiped out in the Big Apple. Con Ed still has the plans for the underground plant and the fish hatchery, even though scientists now say the maximum loss of striped bass would be less than 5%. Who really was the villain on that July night? This is Ronald Reagan. Thanks for listening.